All right. We're here with Wero from San Jose. Thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come over here and uh, share a message. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks for pulling up. Yes, sir. So where are you originally from? I was born in Mexico, and I was brought, I was raised in San Jose. Uh, they brought me at the age of uh, two years old, but I'm originally from Mexico, uh, Chapala, Jalisco, to be exact. All right, so Chapala, Mexico, Jalisco. Uh, at what age did you come over here? Two. I was two when the they brought me over two. here. And at the age of two, where did you guys move to? San Jose, and that's where I was there my whole life. I was raised there in the east side of San Jose. So straight up from Mexico, uh, Jalisco, you, you moved to San Jose. Yes. At the age of two. Yes. So what was what was your upbringing like? Um, well, in the house I lived in, it was my, my grandparents. My grandparents came here two years before I did. And then their kids started coming over little by little. They have eight kids, six boys and two, six male and two female. And, uh, they all started coming little by little to my grandparents' house. And it was actually eight families living in that house. My dad and his brothers and sisters, which all of them had from three to six kids. So it was a house that was very packed with uh, all kinds of kids and uh, all my uncles and aunts. And uh, we live right on the east side of San Jose on King's Story, uh, very uh, Mexican populated. And um, we lived in the house for many years. And uh, all my primos and primas, I had good times because it was a whole bunch of kids. We were always riding bikes, using our slingshots, playing tag, hide and seek. I remember growing up like that and uh, it, it was good times for us, but uh, it was complicated for the adults because you know, you have a lot of females that they want to use the kitchen. They would always get into fights. Our uncles and, and dads always trying to defend their wives. And there was always a little bit of drama in the house. But overall, we all got along. There's always conflict when you have uh, multiple personalities dealing in one household. You're going to have that. Right. Especially in the, in the Mexican culture, right? Yep. What was your relationship like with your parents? I, I never had bad parents. They were... They were really good parents. They did their best on raising me. I feel like they didn't have a, they, they weren't guided the right way, the right way to be a, they could have been better parents. Um, my daddy, he, he did his best, but at the same time, he was uh, out there doing his thing, partying, leaving my mom by herself with the kids. My mom was always frustrated. Uh, taking her frustration on the kids but I never had a doubt that they loved me I never had a doubt that they wanted the best for me but just the fact that the situation they were with it was frustrating for them especially for my mom having a husband but always uh, having just to deal with the kids by herself my dad did the providing this and that but he would take off on the weekends Sometimes he would go back to Mexico for a month or two to party and then come back. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, but overall, we had, we had a good relationship. I knew that they loved me and, and, and I know, knew that I loved my parents. But now as an adult, I can see that they could have done better. Yeah. And uh, I don't blame them at all. All I know is that they did their best and I learned from their mistakes. I'm trying to not do the things they did with my kids. And, uh, but now our relationship is way better. Now as, a, as an adult, we talk about it and we talk about how they could have done better, but uh, I never throw it in their face and, and anything like that because I know they, 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 they try their best. Yeah, and I agree. I feel like every generation tries to beat the next generation or the past generation. Try to be better than, than, your, ne than your last, right? Right. Y'all were trying to be better than your parents. Right. And it's, uh, you know, it's, you got to evolve and right. become better people. And I think that, you know, it's just nat natural, man. I think it's supposed to be done. Right. What kind of, what type of person were you in high school? Ah, and I only went to high school for about a month. A month? Yeah. That's it. I got kicked out. And then I, I got locked up and I never came out. I actually graduated. I got my GED. Uh, 
locked up as a minor. I only went to high school for about a month. That's it. What you get kicked out for? Fights. Fights. I got kicked out of three high schools in less than a month for fights. It was constant fights at that time, and and I ended up getting locked up and not coming out. Where were you fighting over? I was fighting with the with my enemies at that time, which were the Norteños, the Northerners, and uh, San Jose is uh, it's a northern city. The northern Northerners dominate that city. Is at that time when I was uh, gang banging in the early nineties. All out through the 90s, it was uh, basically 80% Northerners and 20% Sureños. So it was a whole bunch of them, and I had to fight them all. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but yeah, I got kicked out for all those fights. So that was the ratio. Uh, Norteños was 80% and Sureños was 20%. Yes. So they had a stronghold over that. Yeah, and it was even worse right before I got to high school. It was maybe 90% at the beginning. And to this point, they is they still there's they're still the majority until this to this day. It's maybe sixty five percent to thirty five percent. But at the beginning, uh, when I when I started gang banging, it was maybe like five percent Sureños and ninety five percent Norteños. And then little by little, it started growing and growing and growing. To this point, it's uh, I think it's about a good thirty five percent, maybe forty. It, but I think I might be pushing a little bit too much. So how'd you get into the gang banging scene, man? Uh, well, like I said, uh, in that house that we lived, there was a whole bunch of us, a couple of my primos. Across the street from my house, there was a house similar to my grandma's house, where there was a whole bunch of brothers. Two or three houses down that house, there was another similar house, a whole bunch of brothers and cousins, and uh, that we all had came from Mexico, right? And uh, we had the same experience with the northerners and our experience was that uh we were always getting called scraps or webbacks and uh, at that time and, and let me clear this up i'm speaking about my time and and in my area it might have been different in different cities or in different parts of san jose but i'm talking about my time and in my area in my experience other sureños might have had a different experience on the west side of San Jose or in the different part of San Jose. But I'm talking about my time in the early 90s on the east side of San Jose on King and Story. And uh, at that time, the Norteños, uh, they used to call us scraps and wetbacks just because the fact that the Norteños were already, uh, they were, they, they, they were, uh, part Mexican, but they already knew how to speak English. Their parents had good jobs. And then and, and they treated us different, or well, at least most of my cousins and uncles and people that were coming from Mexico, they, they would get on them. They would call them scraps and wetbacks. And I started getting hate, hate towards them. And I started wondering why would they call us scraps and wetbacks? And they called us scraps and wetbacks because we came from the South. We came from Mexico. And, um, and I started getting hate, st hate towards them. I didn't like them. Even though by the time I was in middle school, I already knew how to speak English a little bit better than my, my, my cousins and a little bit better than, than my uncles that were coming from Mexico or friends that were coming from Mexico. And they wouldn't pick on me as much, but just the fact that I would see them pick on my family, my friends, I started getting hate towards them. And so did the guys that lived across the street from me, they started getting hate towards the Norteños. And I started uh, connecting with people that hated the Norteños for that reason. So um, we, started get, we started a gang. We started a gang. I remember when that, I remember that day we were trying to even figure out the name. What should we call ourselves? Should we call ourselves this, this, and that? And we ended up calling ourselves Barrio Sureño Mexicanos. Sureño, we call ourselves Sureños because we came from the south. And we knew they hated Sur. By that time, we knew they hated Sur, and we knew they hated the 13. And uh, Mexicanos, because we were Mexican. Eran los 100% Mexicanos. And, and we, that's what we call ourselves, Barrio Sureño Mexicanos. And we started going at war with them. It all started small in high school, I mean middle school, 
we started getting into fist fights, jump, jumping them, jumping us. And we were getting beat up a lot, man, a lot. And uh, I remember there was a time where there was uh, maybe a, by, by the time I was in eighth grade, there was only two of us, two Sureños against 40 Norteños. We were constantly getting jumped after school. During school, we were getting into one-on-one -on -one fights. After school, they were waiting for us. But I guess I had an ego, man. I said, fuck that. One way or another, I got to get these guys. One way or another, they got to know that they can't fuck with me. And I met two or three guys that felt the same way. And then little by little, we started getting bigger, older, and uh, we started growing. And that's how it all started. So the name was originally what? Barrio Sureño Mexicanos. So in time, that, that name changed? Yes. Why did it change? And what did it change to? It changed to Barrio Sureño Malditos. Um, at that time, there was a lot of, a lot of our homeboys going to, to, to getting locked up, going to jail, going to prison. And in prison, you either got to be a, a Sureño or a Paisa. Sureño, you got to run with the Sureños, you got to run with the Mexicanos, with the Paisanos. And since we were banging Sur, banging Trece, we, we changed our name just to identify ourselves as Sureños. We knew we were Mexican, we knew that was in our blood, but we wanted to bang Sur. And we wanted it to be known that we were Sureños. And we wanted to sound more gangster at the same time, so we changed it to Malditos. Malditos. Yes. How organized would you say your, your, your clica was? At the beginning, we were not that organized. We were, we basically wanted to get numbers. We were just willing, jumping in, anybody who wanted to get jumped in, because we were trying to recruit. Down the road, we realized that it was making us look bad, because we were bringing in and recruiting people that were ranking out, that they were scared. And, uh, we learned that along the way, and then we started getting more strict, more disciplined. And by the, the mid, mid uh, 90s, late 90s, we were very organized already. We were very, very organized. We all knew what we were about. And um, yeah, things changed. But at the beginning, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. All we knew is that we had a group of people that didn't like us and we're at war with them. And about, little by little, we started getting organized. How often were you, were you uh, getting into confrontations with the other gangs? Every day, every single day. Throughout the 90s, there was not a single day that we wouldn't get into confrontations with them. Everywhere we went, in school, in the mall, in the street, everywhere, because they were everywhere. The Norteños were everywhere we went. They were driving everywhere. They were walking everywhere. Everywhere we went, we would see them. And they would see us. And it was fights, fights after fights. I can say throughout my years, I got in at least 160 fights, one-on-one -on -one fights. I can say I got a jump. I was thinking about 30 times, but that's only in the streets. But if I count juvenile hall, I think maybe like about 80 times where I got jumped. I got shot at multiple times. I got thrown off the second floor on the, in the mall. Um, every day, man. Every day was fights, shootouts. It was hard, man. It was really hard in the, in the early 90s to be a Sureño. And um, there was many of us. I remember when the first time I went to Juvenile Hall, I was 12. And there was only one Sureño there. And when I seen him, he had black eyes. I was like, oh, shit. What happened to you? So pinches norteños i was like fuck i'm like all right fuck it's me and you now i'm here with you let's go and it was only in the, in the unit i was saying it was for the little kids from 12 to 14 years old and it was only me and him and uh with 30 norteños so we're fighting every day they wanted to challenge us and and this guy he was down man i i will never forget him and uh we we're fighting side by side every day they would come into our to our to our cell and call us out, what's up? And we'd be like, what's up? Beep, 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 beep. And then other Norteños would be outside the cell and if we were beating up the Norteño, they would all jump in. So we would never win because if we were beating up the Norteño, we would get jumped. If the Norteño was beating us up, then they would let it go. You know what I mean? And uh, 
Me and my homie used to look at, us, at each other like, fuck, te partieron la madre. And he would be like, no, a ti te la partieron más gacho. We would laugh. It, to us, it, was, it, was, it started to get fun, you know? And um, it, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was fights every single day. You couldn't walk anywhere without getting into a conversation with them. That's crazy, man. You guys were fighting a whole number of gangs against all odds, and you guys are still there putting up dukes with these guys and, and getting down with, 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 you know, it's a small group of Sudanios taking on a whole nation of uh, Norteño. Yeah, and uh, there's a good, the good thing about it is that the older Norteños, the bigger ones, they didn't see us as a threat at that moment. So we were only dealing with the youngsters, even though there were still a whole bunch. But um, uh, I'm glad that the older Norteños were not taking us as a threat. They were probably like, ah, the little homies will take care of it. These guys will be gone soon. But it, it didn't happen. We, we, we got older. We started uh, saying, fuck this. We're not just going to fist fight anymore. We're going to plot how to get these guys. So we started using the... the the element of surprise, we would, we would knew where they would hang out at certain times and we would come and get them. And sometimes we would even uh, dress up in red, making them think that we were their homeboys. And once we got close to them, thras, we would do our thing. And then we started hanging around with, I started hanging around with other homies that, that they had the same mind as me, like, fuck this, we're not gonna lose. We gotta win one way or another. And then our minds got connected and we started feeding that to all the new recruits and next thing you know, we're getting stronger, bigger, and, and just growing and growing. You go to juvenile hall, <clears throat> you start meeting uh, more more homies from different sides of the town that they had the same experience as we did. So we start, that was our, because uh, now you have social media, phones and everything, you can connect with everybody. At that time, there was no cell phones, no social media. Our network was in jail. That's how we would meet other people. And then we would connect. And then we started uh, clicking up and, and we all had the mindset like, fuck that, we gotta teach these guys that we're still here, that we're not gonna let them punk us, and we just started growing it. What would you say the percentage is now with the Sudanios up there, upstate? I think it's uh, 35% uh, Sudanios and 65% Norteños. So it's jumped up a little bit. It's jumped up a little bit, but not only that, but now the mentality and the way the Sudanios work now is way different when we started. Now they're smarter. Now they know how to organize crime. Now they know how to recruit. Now they know how to get things done. And now they're, the Norteños are dealing with a higher caliber of Sureños than in, when it was in the late 80s or early 90s. So you have served uh, prison time? Yes, I've done every type of jail, man. Uh, from juvenile hall, county, or prison, even in Mexico, I've been locked up. <laughs> Damn, you Mexico? Yeah. That's crazy. So, how would you describe your your, uh, your experience uh, serving prison time for the very first time? Not juvie, but, but prison time. Um, the first time I went to prison, um, I actually was only in a reception for a year. It was in San Quentin. And I was excited when I went there, to be honest. You know, we all want to get there. We all hear the stories, the war stories. And um, I got to reception in San Quentin. At that time, Santa Clara County was sending everybody to, to the reception with San Quentin. Excuse me. And um, I was there for a whole year in reception. The prison was so full. They were taking so long to send people, to ship people out. And, and, and I was in San Quentin. And uh, the majority of the homies who were there were from the Bay Area or from up north, I say 90% were from up north and 10% were from down south. I met homies there from Santa Rosa, even from Eureka, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, Mountain View. And uh, I wanted to get my points, man. I wanted to be the baddest one. And, and I remember um, in San Quentin, I had uh, three, days three days left to go home. And uh, the homies uh, sent a letter saying that the next day we're going to get down with the Huras, with the COs. Because for the last past few weeks, they were disrespecting our pad, ourselves. They would go in our cells, search our cells, 
throw down the pictures from our loved ones that were on the walls. And um, they, they send the kite, be ready, suited and booted the next day. We're gonna get at the seals. We're gonna let them know that they are no longer allowed in our cells. And if they don't uh, comply to that, then we're gonna go at it with them. And then I remember that time in my mind, I was like, fuck, man, I got three days left to go home. And I was like, fuck it, pues ni modo, ya estamos aquí. Vámonos recio. And I remember we went to the chow hall, to cafeteria, and we were all suited and booted, ready to go. And uh, I told the homies at my table, which were all from San Jose, I told, you know what? I don't think we're going to be able to get all the, all the juras, but this motherfucker, I hate this fool. He's always fucking with us. So no matter what, all of us, let's just focus on him. Let's make sure we get him. And I said to myself, I'm already in this shit. Might as well. Even if I get released, I'm going to be back in prison sooner or later. So might as well earn some stripes here. Might as well show everybody who the fuck I am, right? So Chow Hao ends and uh, the CEOs flash the light at, at the tables so we can start going back to ourselves. And none of the homies get up. And the CEOs react. And then one of the homies says, hey, we want to talk to, to the metal chingon, to the lieutenant. And, uh, and less than five minutes, bro. The Power Rangers come in with helmets, shields, super soakers. The gunners are up there. And it's about 80 of them, right? About 80 COs. And it's about 120 homies. So we're like, all right, fuck it. This is it. Aquí es donde va a valer madre. And I told my homies, ¿Están listos? And they were like, Simón, güero, vámonos recio. And I told them, that motherfucker right there, that's the one we're going to get. They were like, Simón, güero, Simón. And, um... The, the homie talks to the, to, the, to, the, to the lieutenant. He says, hey, check it out. You motherfuckers been disrespecting our pad. You guys work here, but we live here. And from now on, you guys are not allowed in our cell. And uh, the, the, the CO replies in this way. He looks around. He sees all the CO's ready with their super soakers, with their put batons, with their the cueteros are up in the towers. Every, everybody's ready to go. The homies are already suited and booted. We're all, we all have the mean mug face, mean mug face in our faces, right? And the, and the, the Hura looks around. He says, you know what? I want all my CO's to go home to their families. And I want all your people that are going to go home pretty soon to go home. So we give you the word, our word that uh, the seals will not go to your cell anymore. And I was like, what the fuck? Uh, it was crazy to see the, the, the power that the homies had in there, right? And uh, at the same time, I was happy, but I was like, oh shit, I'm going to go home in three days and I guess, you know what I mean? So that was my first experience in, uh, in, in, uh, in prison. So that power play worked? That power play worked. Wow. It goes to show how much power yeah. there is. Yeah. In unity, right? Yes. So, in your barrio, were you open to letting other races in, or, or, or was it just Puro Mexicano? No, we had other races. All right. We, we have had other races. And uh, not only my barrio, but other barrios in San Jose, uh, we have uh, Asians, we have, uh, well, they have. I'm not we, I'm not, I'm not part of it anymore. Um, I walked out of the main line, I walked out in good standings, but I'm not active. I'm not out there gangbanging, and we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But there's um, there's barrios in San Jose, Sureño barrios that they have Asians, uh, blacks, and even whites. What about women? Yes, there's water with women's. You have w women in your water? Yes, and uh, I plotted that while I was in San Quentin. That time, I was with my homeboy Cyclone, who's a lifer, and. For a, a long time, we didn't allow women in our barrio because our mentality at that time was like, they make our barrio look bad. If they start being uh, going out with all, all the other homies, they're going to make our barrio look bad. But at that time, we were hanging out with, uh, there was three badass homegirls. And uh, one of them was married to one of the homies. She was always there. And uh, the homie always brought her with us. And we were in shootouts and fights. She was always, she was gangster, man. And then we had two other homegirls that they were always running with us. And I was talking to my homeboy, a cyclone, which who was a lifer. He and uh, I told him, check it out, cyclone. We should consider getting these three hyenas in the barrio. These are badass hyenas and this and that. Whoop de whoop. 
And uh, he was like, Simon, güero. And it, when I got out, I talked to the homies, hey, check it out, man. These three hyenas are they're down as fuck, man. And and it'll benefit a barrio in this way and that way, whoop de woo And we ended up bringing the, those three hyenas, those three women to the, to the barrio. And eventually, more and more started coming in, but they were very selective with who we brought in. Yeah. So you did allow them in there then? Yes. At some point, yeah. Yes, so at some point we did. Wow. After many years of not allowing them, we ended up uh, doing it because at that time our mind was, how can we make our barrio bigger? Right. How can we recruit? And, uh, and and what can we do to 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 keep growing and growing and growing? And at that time, the mentality that I had was, if we bring them in, in one way or another, it's going to help us grow more and more, and they're going to be able to they're going to be able to contribute and bring other a woman into the barrio and help us in in certain ways you know what i mean like send homegirls that we can trust to visit certain people that we wanted to give visit to do a, a lot of things and and we ended up allowing them and bringing them in so have you ever been into oh, I, I know you have a conversation with with the other uh the, uh Nor uh, northanians right right is there a story that you have where you guys ran into these guys and shit happened? I mean, do you, do you have a story? And if so, can you tell it? Oh, a whole bunch of them, man. A whole bunch of I them. I believe you do. It, it, like I said, every single day, we got into it with them. And, um... Uh... What's the, one story you have? I'll share a quick one. And it's not incriminating anybody. And, uh... It's not one of those high caliber stories where where people can get incriminated. But um, just a quick one in the late 90s, maybe early 2000, it was me and, uh, me, and uh, four me and a couple of homies were at a party and we met, we, we met some females there and, and we wanted to go throw our own party, we wanted to go throw a Momo party. That's what we used to call them. Let's go, a Mo Let's go to a Momo and throw a party, throw a party out there. So I had a little, a little car, a little Honda, and it was me and four homeboys and a couple of homegirls. We all jumped in the little car. We go to the motel, Motel 6, right behind Chuck E. Cheese, right there on uh, King and Tully, right? So me and my homeboy Loco, rest in peace, we get off to, to, to reserve the, 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 the hotel. And the, the homies and the homegirls stayed in the car. And as we were walking to the, to the office to rent the Momo, there's a Norteño smoking a, a cigarette. We seen him and he sees us. And he looked at us and he said, Are you guys fucking scrapas? And we looked at him and he said, Nah, man, we ain't no scrapas, we're sureños. He said, What? And he ran upstairs. So when he ran upstairs, he starts banging on the door, boom, 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 boom. There's scrapas out here, there's scrapas. So me and Loco looked at each other and uh, boom, they all start running out. As they're running down the stairs, I'm like, fuck, one, two, three, four, five, six, even Norteñas. They were putting up their pants and a whole bunch of Norteños coming out. And I ain't gonna lie to you, man. It was about 16 Norteños and about 10, 10, uh, 10, 10 Norteñas or, or females that were with the Norteños, but a lot of them had four dots, red paños around their hair. Right? And I told Loco, Vamonos. So we tried to get in the car and I tried to turn it on, but they were already too close. And I told the homies, you know what? They're gonna fuck this back and say. So I get off, right? As soon as I get off the car, boom, boom, boom. I start getting down with two, two Norteños. Doot, 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 doot. Then I see my homeboy, uh, Güero, get off the, the, the passenger side. He jumps over the hood of the car. He just power punched a, a Norteño off of me. But there's so many. And then my homeboy started getting off the car, man. We got beat the fuck up, man. To the point where um, I got dropped to the floor and then uh, I seen a Norteño pull out a crowbar. He pulled out a crowbar and I tried to go under the car to get to the other side of the car, you know? I was like, fuck it, I'll go to the other side of the car and get up over there and try to run around and keep fighting, right? But when I went under the car, they grabbed me from my legs and they tried to pull me out. And with the crowbar, with the sharp end, they were trying to stab me in the, in the back of my head and the back of my in my back. But I had a big ass Ben Davis jacket. At that time, I don't know if you remember those jackets, man. We used to wear those big ass Ben Heavy Davis duty, jackets. Yeah. They're pretty thick, man. So I was covering my head 
And uh, I could, uh, through the corner of my eyes, I could see my homeboys getting beat up, man. They were getting dropped. I said one of my homeboys, one of my homeboys, uh, this fool had just came out of YA. He was on soul status. He, he was healthy and everything. He, and he got against the wall. He was just like, bing, 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 bing. They couldn't drop him, right? But uh, the, uh, uh, the rest of us, we got dropped, man. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sit here and act like a superhero. But um, with that crowbar, they were trying to poke me in the back of my head and, and in my back. And um, a car came. It was just any, a random bystander. He came, pulled up, started flashing the lights and honking. And the Norteño started with the cops. So some, one of the Norteños said, La Jura, La Jura. And they all ran and they started leaving. But... Um, yeah, man, we, we all got up. Me, me and my homeboy started looking at each other. Black eyes. My, the, even though I had the Ben Davis jacket, the, the crowbar still penetrated to, through the, the Ben Davis jacket and got me on my back. And uh, that's the kind of stories and shit that we went through. And there was a point where we said, fuck this, we ain't gonna lose. And then that's where the gunplay started coming in. Right. And uh, we started, the more we got beat up, the more mad we got. So the gunplay started coming in, the, the, the organizing and plotting, how should we get these guys without us getting hurt started coming in. But yeah, that, that's how life was in the, in the 90s. Hey, at least you guys walked away with your lives. That yeah, day. fortunately we did. Yeah. And there's other times where homies didn't walk out with their lives, you know, but yeah. I don't want to. We can't talk about those kind of things in here. Maybe there's still cases pending and yeah. this and that, you know. But at that time, that's a story that I think I'm able to share without um, getting anybody in, in trouble. Oh, oh, awesome. <clears throat> so, hey, th there was a podcast that you were on not so long ago, uh, Hoodstocks. Yep. And uh, it ended up ending rapidly right. at the end. Yeah. Abruptly. Yeah. Right? W what happened there? Uh, yeah. So I was in the podcast in Hoodstocks, and um, I went to share a message, just like I am today. I have to, and to get to the message, I got to share the story of my life, how it started, in order so people can understand the message I'm bringing. And that's the same thing my plan was in Hoodstocks. Go share my story, how I grew up, where I grew up, why I started banging, how, and how eventually I was able to get out of it and become a successful man. And when I say su successful man, I don't mean only money-wise. I mean successful in my marriage, su successful with my kids, with my society, with my community, and with the people around me. And... Um, that's what I went to the podcast for. And the way it ended wasn't the way it was planned to be. And a lot of people were wondering about it. And a lot of people were curious what happened after and why did it end it that way? And what do I think about it? And what do I think about Lucky? And if I felt disrespected, if I have hate or anger towards that, and I don't. And I understand why Lucky did it that way. It had to be done that way. Um, for his safety and my safety, for everybody's safety, for nobody to get locked up, for nobody to get in confrontations, because there was information that Lucky knew and that the caller that called knew that I didn't know. So when the caller called about me being on uh, the podcast, with Flaco, um, the the environment changed a little bit, and I I was able to sense it, but I was confused. I was like, "What the fuck? What the fuck is going on?" And I didn't know what was going on, right? But Lucky knew, the caller knew, they knew that the, this individual had been an informant 15 years ago, and that I had associated with him in a way through a podcast and, and been in communication with this guy. So therefore, that was not good for the active community. And it had to be ended. And I understood it when, after we talked about it. But at the beginning, I didn't understand it, right? Because I didn't know about this situation about 
this other individual. And I'll explain a little bit about this individual so people can understand the reason why me and this other individual were in communication. Uh, this uh, Flaco was at a time doing a, a video. I was randomly going through YouTube and I, I heard a, a Flaco doing a, a spill on the upstate Sureños from San Jose, which that's where I'm from. And he was talking, talking with respect and that caught my attention. But Flaco missed some points and I sent him a message, hey, check it out. This was a little bit different. This is how it really started. And, and anyways, me and him started communicating about, about it. And then he learned more about my story life, about how I was gangbanging in the 90s, how, about how I became a successful man. And he liked the story. He said, hey, what old, would you mind sharing that on, on my podcast? I was like, nah, not at all, man. As a matter of fact, I'll be glad to do it. I want the youngsters and other people to know that there's still hope to change, that there's still hope to make a change in your life, especially if you're out of prison or if you got a release date in prison, you can still do something with your life. And that's all my mind was focused on when I was talking to Flaco. And I never looked, Flaco, looked up on Flaco's background. I didn't give a shit, man. I wasn't in that gang banging mode. I wasn't asking Flaco about paperwork. I wasn't asking him about his past. I wasn't asking him about nothing. You know what I mean? And um, so I shared my story with Flaco on his podcast. And, um, and that was that. After that, Flaco, let me tell you this about Flaco. Flaco to me, he's a very good individual. He's really a person with a good heart. He made a mistake in his past, which is haunting him now. And the only reason I don't communicate with Flaco no more is not because no man told me to do it. Nobody told me to, to do it. I did it on my own choice because nobody tells me what to do. And I'm not saying that with an ego. I'm just saying that because that's the, the change I made in my life. I make my own choices. And I made that choice because Flaco made a mistake in his past that some people are never going to forget. And they're going to get him when they see him. So if somebody's looking for him, then that means his life is in danger. And whoever he's around with is going to be in danger too. So I don't want to put myself in that danger or my family. So I decided my, on my own to not keep in communication with him because of that. You know what I mean? But any, other than that, I think he's a good guy. And uh, to the point where um, there was a, uh, about a year ago, one of my homeboys got killed. And I called him. I didn't even call my homeboys or anybody because I don't want to hear a... I knew what my homeboys were going to tell me. Like, fuck these fools. Let's figure out how we're going to get them, this and that. You know? And I knew Flaco had a positive mindset. And I wanted to hear something positive. And I called Flaco. Hey, Flaco, check it out. My homeboy died. And his, his, his word was this. Güero, don't even trip. It's natural for you to feel that way. But don't get into that, Güero. Stay away. Focus on your family. Remember, you got a family. Remember, you got kids. Remember, you got this and that. And I started getting some type of respect for Flaco, right? Because instead of him saying, oh, you know what? You got to do this. You got to do that. He started talking positive to me. And he started changing the hate that I had in me to something positive. So to me, Flaco was cool, you know? And, um, and then there was this one time where he was in town. And he hit me up. He said, hey, where do I'm in town. You want me to roll up? And I was like, yeah, pull up. He came over to my pad. And, and then he, for, he was there for a while, for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then he took off. But our communication was always about something positive, right? And we would never talk about, uh, to put it this way, we never talked about anything about the situation that got him into a bad standing in his life. So I didn't really know, man. And in the situation with Lucky on Hoodstocks, I got caught by surprise. When the caller called and he said that I, wasn't a, I had done an interview with Flaco and Lucky asked me, I was quick to respond, yeah, I, I did an interview with him. But at the same time, my little antennas went up and, and I sensed something to the point where I asked him, ¿Qué onda? Is there a problem with this? Is there a problem with my message? Is there a problem with what I'm doing? And um, even though he said no, that everything was good, I still sensed something, right? 
And uh, it wasn't until he cut it, cut the video, and we talked afterwards. After we talked, he let me, he let me know everything about Flaco. He said, hey, this, got, this vato was an informant. He wore a wire. He went to court. And I was like, what the fuck? And then him and the, and the other guys that were with him, there they, they told me straight up, hey, it's nothing against you, Wero. But with the vato, they did an interview. He did this, this, and that. And if we continue with the podcast, there's people that can come over here and shit can happen. I was like, oh, shit. Now I understand. And from there on, I wasn't mad anymore. Because I was, if I was in the active status and I was gangbanging, I would have done the same shit. Like, what the fuck? Why are you here? If you are associating with people that were a wire, you know what I mean? I would have done the same exact thing. So I understood it. And a lot of people don't understand that. And they, they take it as disrespect. And I did it. I understood it. And um, after that, me and Lucky talked about it. We shook hands. I shook hands with everybody that was there, with his homies that were there. And I was on my way. And uh, that's um, when I was on my way home, Flaco texted me. He said, hey, Flaco, uh, bueno, I never pc it up. He confirmed that he did wear a wire, that he did go to the stand, and uh, that there is people doing prison time because of what he said. And I was like, fuck, man. I didn't know this. I told Flaco, I didn't know this about you, Flaco. And Flaco was like, hey, bueno, I thought you knew. I thought that you had looked, looked me up. I was like, nah, man, I didn't know this. And from now on, Flaco, I can't associate with you and I hope you understand that man al rato and hung up and that was it man that was uh, the, the situation with a uh, with a flock with flaco and, you know there's a lot of people running their mouth talking shit trying to put me in a claiming that I'm in bad standing for me associating with a person like that but everybody makes mistakes man and at this time of my at age, the age that I'm in right now in my 40s I don't give a shit man I'm not asking people for paperwork i'm not asking people about their backgrounds all i'm focused is on staying positive bringing a positive message helping on my family helping on my loved ones and that's about it but um i don't feel disrespected about how lucky ended the po podcast i understand it why he did it and i'm glad that you put put that out there now that pe people are gonna understand why it was ended abruptly and because what reason uh, when you were having discussions with Flacco, uh, was there any time where Flacco told you about anything about his past? Nah, not at all. And I'm so picky with uh, associating with people that have a bad past. As a matter of fact, when I started my YouTube channel, uh, somebody... Uh, uh, send me a message that I should click up with so-and-so so my channel can grow. But I knew that this individual was already, uh, this certain individual, won't mention his name, had already PC'd up while he was in prison. And I told my wife, I can't. Even though it would be good for the channel, it won't be good for me. Because I cannot associate with people that had actually PC'd up while in prison. And even though they're trying to send a positive message, just the fact that they PC it up in prison, it'll get my name dirty because I came out clean and in good standing from prison. I told my homeboys, hey, I'm out of prison. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. I'm going to stay focused with my family, my wife and kids and ju just keep it positive. You know what I mean? Even though I'm not active, I still cannot associate with people that, are P that had PC it up or Nonetheless, that had snitched, right? So I didn't know that about Flacco. He never mentioned anything. We never talked about it. Because our communication was like, it mainly text, buenos dias, well, hope you're having a great day. And I'll be like, all right, Flacco, buenos dias to you too. Have a great day. Once in a while, he would call me, hey, Wero, just calling you to check up on you, see if you're doing good, see if you need anything. Be like, nah, Flacco, I'm doing good, man. I'll let you know if I need anything. So all right, Wero, stay strong, stay positive. Those were our communications. Once in a while, here and there, like maybe two or three times to the most, we talked about people that we knew in common. He would be like, hey, did you know such and such? And I'd be like, yeah. And he would tell me, oh yeah, me and him got down in juvenile hall. And we would crack up about, crack up about it. And then I would tell him, you know such and such, Norteño? He'd be like, yeah. And I'd tell him, well, yeah, I got down with him. And it was a cool fight, you know. He gave me a good run up and this and that. And uh, But it was five minute conversations here on the phone, this and that, but mainly about People that he knew and I knew that we got a, had gotten into fights. But other than that, uh, nothing that 
I knew about his, the, the situation that got him into bad standings. You know what I mean? And a lot of people were like, they would be like, how can you not know about this about Flacco? It's on social media and this and that. Like, man, I'm a busy man. I got six kids. I got a wife. I own properties. I'm getting people jobs. I'm keeping people jobs. I'm doing this and that. I don't have time to be checking people's backgrounds. I don't go through every single video on social media. I go through a video here and there. I was just telling my wife about this, um, the interview that uh, Conejo did with, uh, with American Cholo. It took me two weeks to listen to the whole interview because I would watch it 10 minutes at a time. You know what I mean? And I barely finished yesterday, the, 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 the interview from Conejo with American Cholo. And uh, that's just to give you an understanding of how busy I am. I'm always running up and down with my kids, sports, getting people's jobs, keeping people in jobs, um, with my wife. I'm everywhere, man. And it took me like about two weeks to listen to one interview. And uh, I don't have time to listen to every single interview. Everybody does, you know. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. Some people have to understand that you're you're new to, to the to the social media scene. So of course you're not going to know a lot of things that are going on. You're not on it like that, like a lot of other people are, right? Right. If you would have known that Flacco was an informant before you even did anything with him, would you have continued that communication with him? Not at all. Not at all. And not because of politics or because I'm trying to act like an active gang member or any of that. Just the fact that as a man, I know that I have to stay away from danger. I have to keep my family away from danger. And a person who has been an informant, a person who has put people behind bars, his life is in danger. The people that are behind bars or that organization is not going to forget about it. So they're going to try to get them. And if they're trying to get them, anybody who's around them is going to pay consequences too. And therefore, I wouldn't put myself in that situation. I wouldn't put my family in that situation. So the answer is no. I would have never communicated with him. I would have never kept in touch with him at all. No, I didn't think so. <clears throat> so... You had a podcast, Weddle's, Weddle's Chronicles podcast. It was fairly new. When did you kick off with that? Yeah, so I started the podcast about two, three months ago. It only lasted two weeks, unfortunately. But before I created it or started it, I was iffy about doing it. One, because I know YouTube brings drama. And... I was seeing the drama. I was watching all these YouTubers having drama amongst each other. And I was like, God damn, are they gonna drag me into this drama shit? And then I said like, nah, I'm not gonna do YouTube. But then something inside of me wanted to do it because I wanted to bring a positive message. I wanted to bring a message to the people that are out there thinking that it's the end, that they cannot do something good in life. And I wanted to show people that even though you've done mistakes in your life, that you've done drugs, you've been in prison, and you have been an absent father, as long as you're still out here, or as long as you still got a release date, you can still make a change in your life. You can still become a, a somebody positive in, in the community. And I did it. So if I did it, I know anybody else can do it. So I wanted to motivate those people that, that wanted to make a change in their life. I wanted to show those kids that are thinking about joining in gangs that it's not worth it. You know, that there's something better than that. And that was the whole reason I, I wanted to start YouTube. And that's the reason why I started it. I started off a clean page, a clean YouTube page with the positive message. I, sure, I shared basic stories, war stories about my life. I never incriminated anybody. I never talked about organizations. All I, talk about, all I talked about was my experience, the choices I made, the consequences I had to pay, and how I overcame them, and uh, how I became successful in life, how now I can be a good husband to my wife, how I can be a good father to my kids. And I know I'm a successful person, not only because I own properties, because I own homes, 
But I'm a, I know I'm a successful person because my wife loves me. She wants to be with me everywhere I go. If I tell her, hey, I'm going to go here, she'll be like, can I go with you? Can I go? I'll be like, hell yeah. I like it when you're with me. And then when my kids need advice about life, they call me. My older kids, I got a 20 year, the, my oldest one is 22 years old and my youngest one is five. And they know they can all count on me. Whenever they need advice about in life, about anything, they call me. My son, he's a Marine, he's in Hawaii. He calls me, hey dad, I'm thinking about doing this, this and that, what do you think? And I tell him, I give him advice. Uh, my, my, my smaller kids, they do drawings, they do this, and they say, look at what I did. They want to hear my words. I'm proud of you, son. I like what you're doing. They look for me. And that's how I know I'm successful. You know what I mean? Uh, they're always looking for me. My wife and my kids, they always want to be around me. They count on me as a provider, as a protector, as somebody that they know they will have nothing but love. And I wanted to share to people how I did it. And maybe they can apply that to their life and maybe it could work for them. You know, that was my whole point of YouTube. But unfortunately, that little drama happened. And um, I just, most importantly, over me sharing the message, a positive message, I got to protect myself from me turning to the old me. I don't know if that makes sense. And uh, that YouTube drama made me realize it's so easy to trigger for me to become the old me. So for me to wake up that me that's still sleeping. And uh, it, it just got me a little bit frustrated and I seen the old me trying to wake up. I seen the old me pounding those walls and almost breaking them down. And so I said, nah, fuck that. I gotta stay away from the drama. I gotta just stay focused on what I'm doing. Family, kids, stay positive. And I'm still helping people, but it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm still helping out my community. I'm still helping out uh, men around me that need a job. I'm still helping out youngsters that need to know how to get a job. How, uh, I'm still doing the work, just not on social media, just not like how I wanted it bigger and uh, so everybody can see other cities and uh, other states, you know. I'm just doing it locally for my own, uh, I don't want to say safety because I'm not scared, but for my own, uh, for my own good, eh, not, not even for my own good, for everybody else's own good. Because I know my wife don't want to see the old me. I know my kids don't want to see the old me. And I know my enemies or those people that run their mouth, they definitely don't want to see the old me. And I definitely don't want to be the old me. And uh, did you, I go off track? No, you're right on track. Uh, are you considering bringing it back or, or is it a done deal? Uh, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Just, just for the reason what, why I said um, there's still things that bother me that can trigger me to be um, the old me. Like people can run their mouth and call me a coward for not still gangbanging. And I, I can just shake that off. But if people talk about my family, or if they talk about mi gente, mi raza, then those things trigger me. And I still, I'm still managing how to control that. And uh, without me having to do something to the extreme where I'm behind bars or, or make a, a stupid mistake where my kids, my, my family and my kids have to pay the consequences for a poor choice that I made on a reaction. You know what I mean? And unfortunately, YouTube will pull out those things out of me because eventually they'll see when they talk about me calling me a coward for not staying active and still continue to fighting for that cause. They see that that ain't going to cause an effect on me, but eventually they'll start talking shit about my family. They'll start talking shit about my race, my, mi gente, mi raza, and that's going to be hard for me to hold back on. So there was a, a podcast channel that referred you as the paisa, right? As a paisa chicano or whatever. And uh, how do you feel about the, that? Well, those are the kind of things I'm talking about. Those are the kind of things that trigger me. 
that make me like, oh, motherfucker, you really want to run you? And this and that, you know what I mean? And uh, this is the thing that people need to understand about when they call me a paisa. To me, I take that with pride. Porque yo soy paisano. Yo soy mexicano. Before I was anything, I'm a Mexican. Soy mexicano. Soy raza. I was born in Mexico. So de Chapala, Jalisco. La sangre azteca corre por mis venas. So when somebody calls me a paisa, I don't take that as an insult. What I take as an insult is making it seem that being a paisa, being a mexicano, is a bad thing. You know what I mean? So they made it seem like if it was a bad thing. But it's not. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of being a mexicano. Yo soy orgullosamente mexicano. And, um, but when they try to make it seem like it's a bad thing, it reminds me back to when I started gangbanging. You know what I mean? When I was a little youngster, they, they used to call me a wetback and a scrap because I was from Mexico. And that's the reason my hate grew. And I started going against uh, these people. So now I ha somebody else calling me a paisa doesn't insult me. But just the way they try to make it seem like if it's a bad thing, then that gets me mad. And when I start feeling that mad, the hate inside of me, I say to myself, like, oh, fuck. That old me is trying to rise up. And I said to myself, oh, no, no, no. Calmate, güero. Calmate. Focus on your family. Focus on what you're doing. Tus hijos vienen primero. Fuck this vato that's running his mouth. Fuck this. Who, like, he doesn't know you. He don't know shit about you. I mean, I know in a fight, I'm not going to put a crema on mis tacos, but I know in a fight, I can defend myself, man. I've been good at fighting. I've been fighting since I was 12 years old, man. I've been jumped multiple times. I've been on one-on-one -on -one fights. If I'm good at anything, it's fighting. You know what I mean? And, and if I'm not good at something, it's losing. I don't know how to lose. That's my ego. I don't know if that's a blessing or, 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 a, curse. or a curse. Because I don't know how to lose. If I go at it with somebody, one way or another, I have to win. And... That's the bad thing about me. And that's why I want to stay away from the negative stuff. And I'm trying to take care of myself from not getting involved or putting myself in a spot where they can drag me in something negative. So, therefore, I don't plan on doing a YouTube channel, but I do plan on working with my community. Um, me and my wife uh, have plans of teaming up with the coaches from school with the kids and the sports. Um, we talked about helping single mothers that have kids that se le están descarriando el camino. Uh, we're planning on buying a ranch pretty soon. Excuse me, and have a, a lot of acres, five acres at least, and do a racetrack so we can bring kids so they can have fun, have horses, man. Uh, have a shed where I can teach men how to use tools. You know what I mean? It's gonna be on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on hands-on, you know what I mean? And uh, I will be able to identify people that actually want to do something positive with their life and bring them. This is what I tell my wife and I tell my kids. If you show me that you want to make a change, I'm going to help you. But show me. I tell my kids, I'm going to be there for you as long as you show that you want to do something good. I'll provide everything for you. I'll get you a car. You don't have to pay rent. As long as you're going to school, as long as you're taking care of your business, I'm going to be there for you. I tell my kids, but if you're out there drinking, smoking dope, this and that, don't count on me for shit. I'm not gonna give you a car. I'm not gonna, you're gonna have to pay rent. You're gonna have to go live somewhere else. And I tell my wife, if I see men or youngsters that actually wanna make a change, I'll do whatever I can. I'll find them a place where to sleep. I'll get them a job. But you gotta show me that you're not doing drugs. You gotta show me that you wanna take care of your kids. You gotta show me that you wanna take care of your wife and family. You gotta show me something. And I'll bring you to my ranch. I'll let you bring your wife and kids and ride the horses. I'll bring you to the racetrack. I'll take time away from my family to come and dedicate some time for you. So you can become a better man. So you can become a better teenager. You know what I mean? But you need to show me that you want it. And um, that's the kind of person I am. And that, that's what I'm going to do. And I think I'm able to work with that without me getting dragged into drama. You know what I mean? And uh, therefore, the YouTube channel, uh, there's no plans at all. If anything, the, the closest I'll get to doing a YouTube channel is maybe uh, while I'm teaching men how to work or while I'm taking kids 
to, get, to go camping or, or fishing or uh, horse riding, I'll do little clips here and there and I'll shoot them to you, man. And, and you can figure out how to share that message, you know what I mean? I'll shoot it to you, shoot it to your hands and, and then I'll just walk away from it. You know what I mean? But uh, other than that, I don't want to put myself in a spot where I can drag, can get dragged in into drama because pff, I hate drama, man. And, and I hate drama because once I'm in it, I don't want to lose. And, and I refuse to lose, so <laughs> I don't want to put myself in there. Oh, well, you got a lot of positive plans in your future, man. And I give you accolades for that. You know, you're, you're, you change your ways. You're on a positive path, and you got your head on straight. So to me, you're a good person. You're That's honest, it. and you're honest with yourself more than anything. Uh, if, if you can give a positive message somebody, to somebody out there that's coming up who's thinking about maybe joining a gang or anything, do you have a, a message to give them? Yeah. One of the reasons why I joined the gang, we talked about it, um, I felt some kind of hate towards some people that were hating against my race, but I continued to stay in the gang for another reason. Because it made me feel like a man in some sort of way. It made me feel like I had a power. Um, I was always trying to escalate myself and advance. And at first, I remember as a little teenager, I wanted to go to juvenile hall and see how it was like. I wanted to go to juvenile hall and confront all these Norteños and fight them all to feel like I was a man. From there, I wanted to go to prison to show people that I can go to prison and walk out with my chest up, all tatted up, to feel like a man. And um, in reality, what I was doing is I was running away from responsibilities because it was easy being a gang member. It was easy stabbing somebody. It was easy pulling the trigger. It was easy going to jail. Anybody can do that. It doesn't take a man to do that. It makes you feel like a man, especially when you're young and you're trying to grow up and be tough. It makes you feel like a man. But in reality, I was running away from responsibilities because to be responsible is way much harder. It's way much harder and it takes more balls to do that. And uh, I realized that I wasn't really being a man um, in 2009, while I was in Delano, people probably heard this story, but I'll say it again for those who haven't heard it. While I was in Delano in 2009, in my last term, I woke up in the middle of the night to go take a, a leak. And then after I was washing my hands and I, I seen myself in the mirror. And, I, and, and then I, I caught myself looking to myself, to my own eyes deep in the mirror and I said what the fuck am I doing here why am I with another man in a cell why does another man hold the keys to my door why does another man tell me when I have to go do a pegada and I said what the fuck I don't feel like a man anymore this doesn't make sense anymore this is not what a man does. Then I started thinking about my kids out there. They don't have fucking shoes. They don't have good, a good plate in front of them. Because I failed as a man. My jefita's out there crying. She's feeling pain in her heart right now. Because as a man, I failed. And I said, what the fuck? This ain't right. This is not what a man is about. I said, fuck this shit. When I get out, I'm going to do something positive with my life. I'm going to take care of my kids. I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to protect them. How can I protect them when I'm in here trying to prove to other guys that I'm down? That I'm down for a cause that I signed up when I was 12 years old. There was a caller in the, back to the 
podcast on Hoodstock, there was a 37 year old man telling me, you're not down for the cost anymore. You're letting us down. Like motherfucker, you're 37 years old. I signed up for the cost when I was 12. My mindset is not the same as a 40 year old man when I was 12. I'm a grown man now. Now I can really think like a man. He says, but you're letting the city down, the homies, this and that. How can I let my people down? How can I let my rasa down when I'm getting them a job? When I'm keeping them out of prison? When I'm providing for my family? When I'm providing for my kids? How am I letting my people down? When I'm teaching my homeboys kids not to go to jail? When I'm telling my homeboys kids how to get a job? You know what I mean? How am I letting the rasa down? Just because I don't think the same way when I was 12 years old, when I was 20 years old? Nah, you guys got it wrong, man. I'm actually helping the rasa. I'm actually helping my community. I'm actually helping your kids. I'm helping your kids. Because my homeboys know. They call me, hey, güero, mi morros, dan estos pasos, talk to them. Simon, mandamelo. And I, they come to me. I have helped Norteños, Sureños. I don't care what they are, man. There was this man that, um, he was a paisano too, was a grown man. His, his son was in, not doing good. He was smoking crystal and this and that. He said, mi hijo, tan malos pasos. Mi hijo, ayúdalo, this and that. Leo, mandamelo. Little youngster was 19, 20 years old. He was a Norteño. I didn't give a shit, man, what he was. What he banged, all I cared about was this paisano, the senor, he needs help. I could see his stress on his eyes. He wanted his kid, to, his son to do better. And I saw this little youngster, this little norteño, 19, 20 years old, he's stuck on drugs. And I grabbed him and said, hey, wake up, wake up. There's something better. Because I shared this before. Um, when you're gang banging, it's like a nightmare. You know you're doing wrong but you can't snap out of it. It's like when you're having a nightmare and you're dreaming, you know you're in dreaming, but you're trying to wake up. I don't know if that has happened to you, but I had nightmares when I'm not like, fuck, I'm dreaming. Wake up, wake up, wake up, and I can't wake up. That's exactly the same thing that happens when you're gangbanging and you know you're fucking up, you know your family's pains the consequences, you know you're gonna go to jail, you know you're gonna die, you know everything's all bad, but you can't snap out of it. And I, I, I've been helping out little youngsters, man. I don't care what they are, Sureños, Norteños, Bulldogs. I don't care, man. As long as you're trying to change, I'm there. And, and uh, how can you say I'm leaving the raza down? How can you say I'm a coward? Motherfucker, it takes balls to walk away from this shit. It takes balls to, to walk away and say, you know what? People are going to probably run their mouths about me, but I don't care. Because the people that I actually care about, what they think about me, is my wife, is my kids. And they're my number one supporters. You know what I mean? And, and uh, that's my message to these youngsters, man. Wake up. Wake up from that dream. Snap out of it. Become a real man. Become successful. Do something positive. Try to do something. There's something better. There's nothing good about being in a cell with a man. At nights, I go to, before I go to bed, I go to my kids' rooms. I say goodnight to them. See you in the morning. I love you. I kiss him on the forehead. I go lay down, lay down next to my wife, a female. She lays on my chest. There's nothing better than that. What the fuck do I want to be in a cell with another man? Why the fuck do I want to be taking a shit in a cell with another man? How does that make me successful? How does that make me a man? You know what I mean? And, and, and to those youngsters out there that, that want to gangbang, and you want to do so, Go ahead. Be ready to pay consequences. Be ready to pay consequences. Not only you, but your loved ones. Because if you were making bad choices and you were the only one paying bad the consequences, fuck it. Vamos no recio. But the bad part is that the consequences, not only you pay them, but your loved ones pay them. And that's the fucked up part. If you can't make a change for your own self, make a change for your family. For your wife, your kids, your cafita. And I hope you guys can receive this message in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul. Because you can hear it, and you can understand it, but if you don't receive it, it's just going to fade away. It's going to go away. 
you know. Well, well, thanks for being here, man. Appreciate your message. Appreciate your story. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to listen to this and and pull the truth out of it and change their lives, man, because you changed yours. And you're yes. continuing to change yours, man. All respect to you, Weddle. Uh, nothing but uh, wishing you nothing but the best. Thanks again for pulling up. Yes, sir. And uh, before you end this, I want to say to all the Norteños, no disrespect if I said any stories. I have no hate for you guys, man. I fought with you guys for a long time. And uh, you guys were really trying to get me. The cops were really trying to get me. And fortunately, I survived the 90s all the way to 2010. And uh, I have no hate towards you guys, man. Um, I, real, I I seen that uh, that there's nothing good with having hate towards my own people. And the Norteños are my people. They're my raza. We were just fighting because I was, I'm not going to say why they were fighting. I was just fighting for the wrong reasons. I could have made different choices, but unfortunately, my life was... Uh, it, it was made to be fold out that way and, and I did what I did but I have no hate towards the Norteños I have no hate towards the Bulldogs I have no hate towards the Sureños they're still gangbanging everybody can make their own decision everybody can do their own thing I made my decision my changes and I hope my experiences can benefit somebody if it does a toda madre if it doesn't continue to be who you want to be and, and that's it man but have no hate towards nobody and then uh, that's it, man. I want to I wanna say that before this show ended. This, uh... Well, there it is. Well, thanks, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you.